So far, I've introduced you to a range of techniques across both Swift and SwiftUI. I've also dropped a few ways to organize your code slightly better. Well, here I want to explore that a little bit further. I want to introduce you to what's called a software architecture, or more grandiosely, an architectural design pattern. It's really as a particular way of organizing your code. A pattern we're going to look at is called MVVM, which is an acronym standing for Model View View Model. That's the last part is kind of one word. It is a terrifically bad name, a really bad name, and it thoroughly confuses people. But I'm afraid we are just rather stuck with it at this point. And honestly, there is no single definition of what MVVM even means. And you'll find all sorts of folks with too much time in their hands arguing about it online, but that's okay. Here, we're going to keep it simple. We can use MVVM as a way of getting some of our program state and our logic out of our view structs. That's its goal. We are, in effect, separating logic from layout. Now, we'll explore the definition more as we go, but for now, let's start with the big stuff. In Xcode, press Command N to make a new Swift file. I want you to name this thing content view dash view model like that. This is going to handle our map work. So I can import here for map kit. And we're going to use this file to make a new class that manages our data for us and manipulates it on behalf of content view. So our view doesn't really care how the underlying data system actually works. It's all handled here. We're going to start with two trivial things and build our way up from there. First, we'll make a new class with the observable macro attached to it. So we can report back changes to any Swift UI view that's watching. We can say at observable class view model like that. Just open and close braces. Now, as well as that, what I want you to do is take this class, including the macro, and place it inside an extension on content view, like this, extension content view, then all that previous code, like that. So now we're saying this isn't just any kind of view model, it's the view model for content view. And later on, it'll be your job to add the same kind of view model to handle edit view as well. So you can try seeing how the concepts map elsewhere. Now, I get lots of questions about why I place my view models inside extensions like this. So I want to take a brief moment to explain why. This is a small app. We have our content view and our edit view, and that's basically it, okay? But think about how it would look when you had 10 views or 50 views or 500 views. If you use extensions like this, then the view model for your current view is always just called view model. Because when you're in content view, it's called view model, that one there. When you're in edit view, it's called view model, it's the edit view view model, but it's still an extension there, it doesn't clash. The alternative would have names like uh, class uh, edit map location view model and similar for every one of you view view models. It gets very, very long, and putting that inside an extension like this just avoids clutching up your code with all sorts of different class names. We call it the namespace, where all your names are defined. This keeps them carefully siphoned away, view models what you're looking for. So now we have our class in place. We get to choose which piece of state from our main content view should go into this view model, now, some will tell you, just move all of it. Some will say, actually, be more selective. And that's okay, okay? There is no single definition of what MVVM looks like. So I'm gonna provide you with the tools and the knowledge so you can experiment yourself and just try things out and find a solution you like. Let's start with the easy stuff. In our content view, we have these two state properties, locations and selected place they can both move across. So I'll command X those two, go back to our view model, paste them in, and now we can remove the at state private parts. They aren't needed anymore. Classes don't have to have at state. 
and are not private, they're designed to be read elsewhere. And now we can replace those properties from our content view with an instance of our view model. So here we can say we have at state private var view model is a new view model. This is an example of what I was saying about how it's so nice to place view models inside extensions. We just say view model and we automatically, automatically get the content view view model because that's the struct we're in right now. It's just much, much simpler and cleaner. Now, moving those properties across will, of course, break lots of code here. You can see it's airing over the place. The fixes are very, very easy. We're just going to add view model dot in various places. And so here you can see it's for each locations, for each view model dot locations. Problem solved. What else do we have here? It's view model dot selected place. What else do we have? Uh, view model locations append. There we go. View model locations first index. And then view model locations again. Any more of that it? Oops, let it place. So if you want to let it place like that, there we go. So once you've added that everywhere, your code's going to compile again. But you might wonder, well, how's that actually helped? We've just moved our code from one place to another. Yes, that is absolutely true. But there is an important distinction that will become clearer in the future as your skills grow. Having all this functionality in a separate class like this one here, makes it much easier to test your code. What you'll find is that Swift UI views work best when they handle presenting data, meaning the manipulation of data is a great candidate to move external to places like a view model. With that in mind, you might look through content view and start thinking, well, there are some places here where our view is doing a lot of work, uh, ideally really more work than it ought to, and actually, they could move somewhere else. For example, we have uh, adding a new location, which is uh, duh, 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 here, right here, that thing there. That could be moved to the view model. And of course, updating a location, this one right here, that could move to the view model. So we can move these around very easily. And you can see they're both rooting around in the internals of our view model. They're sort of reading the locations first index and modifying locations directly, they're modifying things inside the view model rather than letting the view model handle the logic for us. Now, reading data from a view model's properties is usually fine, but writing it isn't. There's a whole point in this exercise to separate logic from our layout. So you can find these two places immediately. Just clamp down on writing view model data, boom, it'll tell you what it's doing. And so in our view model, we can say these aren't just regular variables anymore and they're not just private anymore. We want private set like that, which means you can read it just fine, but you can't change it. So only the class itself can now modify the locations array and immediately Excel is going to say, wait a minute, you're just modifying things here and here. We can't do that. And so we can start by adding a new method to our view model to handle adding a location, getting it out of the view into the view model. So in our view model, add a new import up here for core location. So we have CL location coordinate 2D. And then add a proper method inside here called add location at point CL location coordinate 2D. And this is just the same code we had before from our content view. So over here, this stuff here, making a new location, we're gonna grab those out. So I'll just command X that code, paste it into here. Gotta make a few small tweaks. You can see it's coordinate, but we now want just point is fine. And then point here, and there's no view model dot there. Otherwise it's happy. So now, we want to add a location rather than doing it by hand in our view over here, we just say view model dot add location at coordinate. The second problematic place is down here when we're updating a location. And so what you want to do is just select this whole if let index check, including the whole ending line, all three lines, and just cut it. Command X to your clipboard, get it out of there, and paste it into a new model in the content view again adding in a check to make sure we actually have a place 
to modify in the first place. So we'll say here, uh, func update location is a location. Check we are correct first. Make sure we have a selected place. Else return. And if we're still here, it means we have a place to modify. I can just go ahead and paste in back open before. Remove view model from here. Remove view model from here. That should be almost there. It should be a selected place like that. That should almost do it. We want location here. Boom. So just modifying the thing. So remove the view model remove and change the correct local names for location selected place like that. And so now updating is handled inside the view model, which is what you want. The logics inside the view model are in the view and the view itself is just going to say, well, yeah, we're finished uh, our thing or press save. We'll do view model dot update location dot zero like that. Just pass in the new location. So at this point, the view model has taken over all aspects of our content view, which is great. All the logic is in there. The view is there to present data and the view model is there to manage data. It's a really nice split. Now the split isn't always as clean as that, okay? There's some, sometimes you might have heard online that you'll get a, a really great split. You, you won't. And again, that's okay. Once you move into more advanced projects, you'll find that there is no one size fits all approach. That doesn't happen. Those things fit in nobody. So we just do our best with what we have. Anyway. In this case, right now, we have our view model all set up here. We can upgrade it so we can handle loading and saving of data. It takes care of all our data for us. This will look in the Herdogs documents directory for a particular file, and then use either JSON encoder or JSON decoder to convert it ready for use. Now, previously I showed you how to locate your app's documents directory using URL, and how to read and write file names in there. But I don't want to do that when loading and saving files. So it means if we ever change our save location, we're going to handle changing it in save and changing it in load. Otherwise, you've got problems. So a much better idea is to add location to your view model as a constant. One place. You can see exactly where it is and all the other code that needs it. So here we'll say, let's save path is our URL documents directory appending the path saved places. And now that's what we'll use when saving and loading. We won't do it by hand every single time. Use that shared path for both places. So if you change one, they both change. And with that in place, we can now make a new initializer and a new save method that makes sure our data is saved automatically. And so first things first, initializer this is going to load the data, decode it correctly, and get it ready to use. Last one, you go, okay? One for you, one for you. Good dogs. All right, skedaddle. Go on, out. So we'll add a new initializer here. We'll say uh, init. We'll do a do block. And we'll get our data is try data content of that save path URL. Nice constant now. Our locations array will be try JSON decoder dot decode an array of location dot self from the data. If it goes wrong, we'll catch saying locations is an empty array, like so. As for saving, previously I showed you how to write a string to disk. Data versions basically the same thing. We can just simply write it out and ask iOS to make sure it's written with encryption. It's only read once you actually unlock their device. Uh, this condition, remember, to asking for atomic rights, so it's also a very, very good idea. It just takes care of security and safety really nicely. So we'll say down here, we have a save method. Again, we've got a do block inside here. And our data is try JSON encoder dot encode our locations. And then try data dot write to our save path with the options of, I'm going to do dot atomic. So again, that means it writes it in one temporary file name fully out the way, then renames at the end, just so instant save basically and also complete file protection, give it maximum security. And again, all it takes to get great encryption is saying complete file protection. It's really, really nice in iOS. We have a catch block here saying print unable to save data. 
like that. So using this approach, we're able to write any amount of data into any number of files. It is much more flexible than user defaults and also allows you to load and save data as needed rather than only when the app launches, which is what you get with user defaults. Now, before we're done with this step, we're gonna make a handful of small changes to our view model so it uses the code we actually just wrote here. First, our locations array up here is initialized to be an empty array by default, but then it's made to be an empty array back here or a locations array here in the initializer. So we're wasting, wasting time. We can ditch that. We can just say, you are not being initialized here. Do it in the initializer like that. And second, we've got to call our new save method after adding a new location or after editing an existing location. So we want to make sure we have save in both those places. And so we add a location here. We'll call save and we update or save here. So saving either way. And hopefully you can press Command R to build and run your code now. We should probably add items freely. Let's go and add a place to Glasgow and zoom in. Maybe we get to. Uh, not particularly glamorous, but we got somewhere at least vaguely in Glasgow area. And like that, uh, I'm gonna say uh, Glasgow sort of as my place. Uh, like that. Let's do one down here in London. Try to slightly better this time. What I get? Bermondsey. Eh. <laughs> um, anyway, um, it's there. It works. So I'll, I'll leave it alone. I'll then press Command Dot to exit the app and Command R to relaunch the app. We should see Glasgow is there with sort of being preserved as well, which is great. And our location is down here in Bermondsey, right? Yeah, there we go. So you can see it saving and loading nicely. Our view model is doing a great job. And what I love about this approach is Content View has no idea what's going on. It has no idea saving and loading is now a thing. It just says, hey, give me a view model, please. And it takes care of that for us. It's really, really nice. So that took quite a bit of code in total, but the end result is saving and loading works really, really well. All the logic is held outside the view. So when you want to learn to write tests in the future, you'll find our view model is much, much easier to work with. Second, when you write data, we're making to iOS encrypted automatically. So it can't be read until the device is unlocked by the user. And third, the best bit of all, the loading and saving is genuinely almost transparent. It just took one tiny bit of code here in our uh, save calls down here, plus initializer. It takes care of everything for us. Honestly, it's just so nice. So that's MVVM. And sometimes folks who are learning, they see this and then they ask me, why didn't you introduce MVVM earlier? Why don't you use it more in the course? And honestly, there are two primary answers. First, it works really badly with Swift data, at least right now, iOS 17 territory. That might improve in the future, goodness knows, I hope it does. But right now using Swift data with MVVM is basically impossible. It's really, really horrible. Second, there are lots of ways of structuring projects with MVVM just being one of many. If you spend all your time locked into the first thing that comes along, you're not learning very much. And so experiment, try things out, find an approach that suits you, rather than getting locked into the very first, first idea that comes along. Of course, our app isn't truly secure yet. We've ensured our data files saved out nicely using encryption so it can only be read once the device is unlocked, which is good, but there's nothing stopping someone else reading the data afterwards.